Get started, or should we give it a couple more minutes? Um, I don't know, it's five after, really. Yeah, why am I in charge? Because <laughs> you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, let's, let's get started. Step back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for coming. Uh, today we're really lucky to have Nick Montfort from MIT here to talk to us about uh, teaching exploratory programming. Um, I want to be Nick when I grow up. Um, you know, sort of in the world of um, interactive fiction and uh, uh, interactive arts, he's one of the few people who's like really deep technically um, and it, on the computer science side and also on the humanities side. And so he has degrees in computer science and creative writing. He um, worked with Justine Cassell at the Media Lab, right? Um, and uh, did a PhD in computational linguistics group at Penn, which is no small thing, and did it on operationalizing theories uh, from the narratology uh, community in, in the humanities so as to uh, enable practitioners to generate interactive stories that would dynamically change the, the portrayal of their work. Um, and he's done you know, wonderful work on the poetics of the interactive work. And he's just, he's really interesting. So uh, please join me in welcoming Nick. Thank you, Ian. And um, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. I'm um, going to talk about exploratory programming, a big uh, um, interesting project of mine for the past few years, something I intend to continue teaching and try to uh, bring to people in the humanities and the arts. And um, so I'll just start with the, this question of what we think of uh, culturally, what we imagine programming to be. Uh, this is one of the most uh, prominent images, according to a, a favorite uh, image search uh, uh, process that we might undertake associated with programming. Uh, some people uh, where I come from might think that this is a very good image to associate with, uh, with programming. Um, and I do think it makes sense to, to take a look at uh, uh, how we associate imagery with this, uh, with this concept. Of course, I could, if I were an anthropologist, I could go out and ask people, I could uh, observe them, I could interview, I could try to figure out what it is programming means to people. But um, alas, uh, as a uh, computer science humanist, um, I, have to, I have to just... Uh, uh, type in the word programming and see what we get. And uh, it's probably not a surprise that these are images associated with programming. There are lots of zeros and ones. I particularly like the ones going back and forth between the guy's head and the monitor in the, in the lower right. Um, uh, when we don't have uh, images for something, we use a word cloud. So we see that occurring a lot. Um, but it looks like a very uh, 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 imposing, intimidating, abstract uh, type of process. And in fact, that is culturally what we, what we think about programming. An image that I like uh, a lot better to represent programming is this one. These are 12 year olds uh, that are, um, are working with uh, Alan Kay's uh, small talk and uh, are uh, working on projects. They're not, they're not engaged, they're collaborating together, but they're not engaging in, you know, uh, the uh, pair programming uh, of agile methodology, right? They're actually just, you know, working on projects, sharing their work. Um, and, uh, and they're able to do things that are visual, that cross media, um, they're able to work with each other. Um, and, uh, and so for a long time, there have been alternative ideas of what programming would be. And, uh, and I want to embrace uh, ideas like this. Um, 
uh, we couldn't uh, I couldn't get them to put people on the cover of the book uh, for uh, uh, for my MIT Press book, uh, Exploratory Programming for the Arts and Humanities. But this is uh, um, actually um, a, a landscape, which I hope suggests uh, that uh, you know it's a little bit inviting. It's an area that might be explored. It's it's not a finished product. It's something that's in construction. Uh, this wireframe that's done by a, this uh, this guy in Greece uh, with the mononym Stavros, um, who was kind enough to let us uh, to let us use this. So he actually developed this image through a process of exploratory programming himself, trying to learn about WebGL, knowing some about graphics programming already. And, and so this is another image I like that suggests something about programming. All right, so with that in mind, um, let me uh, describe the six points that I'm gonna try to hit today. Um, uh, and first of all, uh, um, uh, the, uh, my coverage may be a, a bit superficial, but I'm gonna try to give a sort of full high level view of what exploratory, exploratory programming means to me and what it can mean to people in the arts and humanities. So I wanna characterize the style to begin with, talk about the history of teaching and using the style. I wanna ex express how um, unoriginal I am in uh, dealing with this particular topic and this particular type of pedagogy. And I know that there's people here also who work in this vein and who very much uh, believe in this type of idea. Um, and then I wanna talk about its relationship specifically to uh, what I call creative computing and then its relationship to programming as inquiry. And so these are some things that are a little bit specific to the humanities. Uh, and I'll talk uh, uh, briefly about how I go about teaching it. I'll just, again, just try to characterize this, this idea of how to, how to teach this in the arts and humanities. And finally, I'll relate it to some of my own research and practices because I don't think exploratory programming is just a fun thing for the kids. It's something that I try to undertake when I'm involved with inquiry using computing as well. All right, so exploratory programming. What I'll do, let me hand around um, this book since otherwise it would just be sitting here. Um, and I'll talk a bit about what explore, exploration means and exploratory programming. So I think many of us in computer science are familiar with the idea of exploration and um, exploitation. Uh, so uh, we can think about uh, in mobile robotics, we might have a, a robot that knows how to get to a goal, it, it is aware of a particular path that it can take, um, but that path might be very circuitous. It might uh, not be very direct. There might be a much shorter path. So a robot can choose to either um, exploit its existing knowledge or it can explore and you know, possibly benefit from that exploration. But this isn't something that's specific to technical topics. Uh, we can think about going to the grocery store and we might do so in um, an exploratory or an exploitative uh, uh, type of uh, uh, direction. Um, we might know exactly where all the stuff is that we want. We might rush to get it. We might grab uh, the food and, uh, and check out. Or we might take a look at a new food that's coming into season or new offerings that have been brought around in the store. Of course, depending upon the store that we're at, we might find that uh, exploration benefits us and how dynamic the offerings are in the store, right? We might find that exploration benefits us more or less. But this is something very typical in business process and in many aspects of life, we might be concerned with exploration and exploitation. So my view is that something, again, that should be obvious from uh, thinking about this from a computing standpoint, that exploration and exploitation are both needed. If we were to just explore, uh, that's an agent that just operates at random. And in fact, it wouldn't be learning anything. It would just be uh, producing another exploration uh, each attempt. Um, if we were to just exploit our knowledge, that could work in certain circumstances, but not if our knowledge is incomplete or if the environment is dynamic. So we clearly need to balance these. Um, I believe be beginning and intermediate students of programming um, are often given a very uh, exploitative model of how, of, uh, how to do problem solving, of how to understand certain concepts in computing. And I believe programming education can borrow from the project-based work that we do in design, art, and humanities, so that as people encounter programming for the first time, they understand that it is something that can be used to think with, that can be used for exploration and can be used to generate new ideas. Okay. So this is what's behind my concept of exploratory programming. And uh, I'll talk about another concept that's very important to me, that of creative computing. And creative computing is a term I ripped off from this uh, 1974 to 1985 magazine, uh, edited for a long time by David All, actually briefly edited by uh, Ted Nelson also, Peter uh, Nelson. And uh, look at this, there's another picture of programming of the sort that we don't see these days. Uh, some uh, 
uh, uh, people who are working together, some young people who are programming. And, uh, and it ha it's a very uh, idea that's very consonant in many ways with that of uh, Alan Kay and others. Um, and creative computing was about this. It promoted this type of perspective on computing. So when I talk about creative computing also, I use this term, I deploy it um, in contrast to narrower concepts of maybe art, literature, entertainment, uh, narrower uh, categories of, of what computing can be doing culturally. So I think of actually all sorts of industrial, uh, fine art, popular digital art um, as being examples of creative computing. Do people know about the demo scene? Anyone? We have one of us, two, two people. It's, uh, this is an amazing uh, subcultural uh, uh, Northern European based activity in which these, these people are uh, writing real time computer graphics programs, often very compact, 4K of code in many cases. And um, uh, they're producing very incredible uh, effects, engaging deeply with the specifics of the hardware that they use, and basically making uh, real time generated music videos. Um, out of this. Uh, and it's an activity that, that actually academic computer scientists, as I think I just demonstrated, don't know much about. Curators of digital art in the United States don't, don't know for the most part. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively unknown. But if we had this broader concept of creative computing, we would certainly include the work of the demo scene. Now, net art, like this piece by Jody, would be part of this. Um, people, I, now, uh, just playing Minecraft might not be computational. Uh, um, expressions of culture to begin with, but if we build an ALU in Minecraft, then we have to say that people are engaged with computing there also. Uh, uh, commercial video games, like you know, one of my favorites, Res by Tetsuya Mizuguchi. Um, um, alt games uh, that are uh, based on uh, uh, concepts of identity and 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 uh, and, and difference and and trauma, um, you know, are another example. And then uh, the type of um, hobbyist programming, sort of you know, basic computer games. Um, I think is also an interesting category. Now, if we were to say like, you know, we're interested in video games, then the basic computer games, well, first of all, this book actually doesn't contain 101 games. Some of these things aren't games at all. There are different types of amusements. They're sort of uh, toys and programs to try out. But that's an interesting area of uh, endeavor. And that type of hobbyist programming and play is also something I put into this category of creative computing. So who, who has been teaching uh, creative computing over the years? Uh, just mentions, I think, some of the highlights. Um, already talked about Alan Kay and the, you know, the, we saw the prototype Dynabook that children were programming in on Smalltalk. Uh, Seymour Papert, his work in, in Logo, suggesting that if, if people want to learn um, uh, French, they should go to France. If they want to learn math, they should go to Mathland, which is the computer running Logo and allowing them to um, uh, uh, actually engage through programming directly with the concepts that they're dealing with. And then not as often mentioned with these guys, but I'll, I'll suggest that uh, John Kemeny and Thomas Kirk, who developed the basic programming language in the mid 1960s at Dartmouth, and uh, certainly as an educational endeavor, it wasn't for young children, it was for college age students right at Dartmouth. Um, but what, what they did both wittingly and unwittingly uh, in, in developing basic was to create a system that allowed people to learn to engage in mathematical and other <coughs> concepts um, it wasn't structured as nicely as many of us would like. There was many problems with BASIC, but uh, it was a project that uh, led to more than 90% of uh, the student population of Dartmouth learning to program um, in, by the late 1960s, by around 1970. And uh, considering that this is not, of course, an engineering school uh, we're talking about, this is a liberal arts college, right? It's uh, fairly remarkable for the time. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, BASIC uh, was uh, uh, um, brought by Bill Gates and Paul Allen onto the microcomputer and became the lingua franca of home computing, uh, or the several different ling lingua uh, franca of uh, home computing because it, there were a bunch of different dialects. But nevertheless, it gave access and enabled people to type in their BASIC programs and so on. So these are some of the, some of the people who stand behind this project. Um, uh, from, from my standpoint. And I think there's many, many positive aspects here, but I also want to describe um, some ideas that I have that are relevant in the arts and humanities and, and relevant to the populations I'm interested in, um, high school, uh, undergraduate, graduate, um, and, uh, and uh, people who also completed their formal education. How, how will they encounter computing? So I'll also add in this idea, another unoriginal idea, 
of uh, programming as inquiry, that we can program a computer in order to uh, ask questions and in order to learn about these uh, fundamental topics. This is, I'm, I'm eliciting many looks of non-surprise from people here because this is something that's quite conventional in computer science. In fact, the whole idea of exploratory programming, I mean, certainly by the time a student is doing a dissertation in computer science, you expect that this person has been doing exploratory programming and has been uh, finding out uh, uh, new aspects of uh, the science of computation through uh, working with computation uh, and, and, and as a programmer, maybe not they're doing theory, but in, in many cases, there are those who are engaging with this as, uh, as programmers. Um, well, but I think that programming um, can be used in a variety of disciplines to think about them. And uh, one of the people who, uh, um, although he's best known for, uh, for the invention of the mouse, uh, unfortunately, one of the people who's uh, discussed this is, is Doug Engelbart in his idea of augmenting human intellect, helping us to think better uh, through the use of the computer. And back in 1962, he was already making the argument that it is necessary to program computers in order to fully, uh, capably think with computers, right? Um, that, that there are some people who say that it shouldn't require a human to have to do any, pro any computer programming to do this, but that would be like saying you can't require the operating human to know how to adjust his tools or set up jigs or change drill sizes and the like. Right? So to have a functioning workshop where you're able to uh, work intellectually and think about things, um, you need more granularity than is provided um, uh, by being a non-programmer. You need to understand computation at a deeper level. And in fact, people have been doing this in the humanities. Um, Franco Moretti, uh, not programming himself, but doing the type of quantitative work that is connected to this. Uh, Tanya Clements, uh, this is Ben Fry's visualization of the running of a, 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 a mode that interacts with, uh, with art. Uh, of the running of a, uh, of a processing program um, and uh, a million pages of manga with uh, Jeremy Douglas and, and Lev Manovich um, looking at very large scale questions of how can we read um, and how can we interact with cultural material on a very large scale. And people have, and in fact, people are programming and they're working um, to, to try to do this. And uh, there are people teaching programming as inquiry, a few of these, uh, Daniel Howe, Ian Bogus, Michael Mateus, and Ramsey. There's a, most of these courses that are taught in processing and that are taught to investigate computing with its relation to the visual arts are also looking at inquiry in this way. Um, uh, there are uh, ways that people build up from a smaller, more manageable data sets to be able to examine things in the wild. Uh, they uh, uh, work across different uh, 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 disciplines and practices, um, often in, in, in courses that are project-based, where we're, we're, we're undertaking uh, an inquiry of the sort that we might be if we were writing a paper in the humanities, but we're trying to do this um, through programming. And, uh, and this is one uh, nice outcome. Uh, uh, Chris Peterson um, uh, start, you know, learned uh, the basics of programming in a workshop class for me at MIT and, uh, and went to uh, bring this into his thesis work where he was examining cases um, on, on DIG, actually at the time, of, uh, of how a communities um, uh, practiced uh, forms of self-censorship or user-generated censorship, as he called it. So why, why to do these things um, at this point? Why to be concerned with it? I mean, obviously it's, it's been an interest, aspects of this teaching and aspects of this idea have been an interest since the 1960s. Um, well, I would argue that much as, you know, uh, the thinking of, um, of physicists who um, brought uh, capable mathematical, mathematical thinking um, and a willingness to have models that didn't exactly fit, that weren't as perfect as mathematicians might like, as much as that uh, uh, led to advances in thinking across a variety of fields in the 20th century, um, what is doing that in the 21st century is uh, computer science and uh, thinking about computation, thinking computationally. And some of the examples that we can see are in computational biology, computational linguistics, uh, computational economics um, in a different way, in a, something that's a practice rather than a traditional academic discipline is a practice of architecture. Think about the role of computing in these areas now. It's not that everyone, it's not that everyone who studies computational linguistics, uh, everyone who studies linguistics at all must, you know, directly be doing research in computational linguistics. Someone might be an, an ethnolinguist, someone might, might be doing other studies, 
But that work can't be ignored. The computational linguistics work is critical to the field. It's uh, central to uh, what's going on. It's an, it's an important element. And we can say the same thing in computational economics. You can't, you unlikely you do a PhD just forgetting about the fact that anyone has used computers in economics for the past several years. In architecture, uh, can you imagine if someone proposes, oh, I'm gonna build like a major building in Chicago or some other city of the world, and we'll just do it without computers. We're not gonna use computers, right? That would be, it's a radical, very interesting radical project, but I'm not sure I would wanna fund or inhabit <laughs> that project. Okay, so, so in all these cases, uh, computing is already, it, it, it's not, it's not uh, uh, monolithically pervasive. It's not that everyone must use a computer, everyone must follow these methods, but it's, it, it's unignorable. You, you can't, you can't avoid what it is that's been learned with computing. The humanities is not in this condition. In the humanities, we have a few interesting experiments here and there, but dissertations are completed all the time in which people make no reference to what has been learned through computation. So this is the situation that we're in. We have an opportunity to bring the, the way that computing has already brought additional insights, not by throwing away what's known in linguistics, economics, I mean, not, not by discarding the existing types of thinking, right? But rather by uh, operationalizing it, uh, by uh, inquiring about it programmatically, by thinking about it using computation. Right, so we have an opportunity to do that in the humanities. Um, now, here is the, uh, here's the big secret regarding creative computing and programming as inquiry. As I see it, the way that I try to teach exploratory programming and the way I try to work myself. Um, these two different activities, the art side of creative computing and the humanities side of programming as inquiry are, are really the same thing. They're just different emphases it's just a matter of one's stance or one's focus. Um, but uh, an example of this uh, is provided by Charles O'Hartman at University of Connecticut. So he's a poet. He worked with Hugh Kenner, very famous, uh, very, very famous literary critic who also wrote an Osborne user manual. Um, and uh, uh, he developed this book, Sentences, which is a book, uh, one of the most uh, uh, interesting early books of computer generated uh, poetry. Um, but his work and his practice also involved creating a system called prose um, for the Macintosh, which actually uh, did metrical analysis. So it would determine the stress pattern of different lines of verse, okay? So his analytical practice of uh, determining things about meter by using programming was part of a practice that also included the generation of poetry and making new sorts of work, right? Now that's not a big surprise perhaps, but, um, but this is one of the reasons that I think teaching creative computing and programming as inquiry together it makes a great deal of sense, whether a person has an arts focus overall or a humanities focus overall. And then one final thing I'll say about what's beneficial about teaching uh, this type of work, particularly for people who are, um, for instance, in media studies, is that uh, it's important to, to learn about programming to gain a critical perspective on computational media. I mean, you can actually say this uh, to some extent, probably uh, for citizens in general, people who participate in a society that has electronic voting, um, that has uh, climate change models, that has uh, 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 various computational systems that are going to be critiqued and part of the public discourse, but certainly people who are actively participating in the study of those media and systems, People in uh, uh, critical code studies, software studies, platform studies, um, people who want to um, understand not only creative uh, systems, not only things that are, that are vessels for communication quite explicitly, but ATMs and military systems as well, right? We need to think about these uh, artifacts as something that uh, uh, intimately uh, involves um, code and programming. And uh, if we want to study these systems, uh, it's not that every person, for instance, studying the ATM network uh, would perhaps uh, need to program, but overall, the group of scholars that's trying to understand how that functions in society needs some of that expertise. Um, and uh, of course, this is what this is the moment I'm hoping to get to with my with my students, where where we sort of see that underlying uh, all of these systems in the world, there is code. It provides insight, and there's there's of course a cultural trope like this, the still from the Matrix. 
that uh, we would be able to see underneath and we'd be able to understand better about the functioning of the world um, by, by looking at this. All right. Um, so I'll, I, I only have really uh, uh, three slides about uh, uh, how it is that I approach this. Um, I'd, I'd be glad to, of course, discuss it in, in more detail um, uh, after uh, uh, um, the, my, this part of my presentation concludes. But what I want to describe is a, a little bit about how my approach might, might differ from some of the ones that have been used in the past. So for one thing, um, I teach in more than one programming language. I use Python and processing. They don't have to be imperative languages. They don't have to, uh, they don't have to be uh, these particular uh, languages. They don't have to be um, uh, ones that are either um, uh, made for the visual art purpose of processing or that are widely used commercially. But uh, I do want to share, I do want to show people and share with people that there is something to the idea of learning to program. It's not just Java in 21 days. It's, you know, that like, in fact, if you understand what iteration is, you can uh, deal with, you know, what we all know of as syntactic sugar. And you can think about uh, the way that iteration is done in a different language. And you can, you can work and program in that language. It's not learning how to program over again. Um, uh, so for this reason, I wouldn't teach in uh, uh, a different language every day, but, um, but I do use uh, more than one language in the introductory course. I also work across media in part because people have interests that are focused in different media, but looking at text, uh, uh, image, animation, sound, and then there's of course different things that are afforded uh, by these different media. So um, understanding like how to nest an array, it makes sense to talk about images, right? When one is doing this, but also um, images uh, may be something that, that the analysis of images and understanding how to uh, find, you know, initially some, something as simple as like, which images are the most read, right? Uh, uh, learning how to blur an image and understanding some things about the way that Photoshop and photo manipulation software work. Um, and then, you know, doing image transformation, image generation, uh, and bringing these aspects together can be particularly um, uh, interesting. The set, I, I have a very short section on sound in which I deal with bite beat music, which I'd be very surprised if, if anyone knows about. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, just generating a sequence of bytes in a one line C program. And, uh, and sending them to an audio device. And, uh, and it provides a really fun way actually to explore you know, bitwise operators and other things um, in, in, a, in a media rich and exciting uh, and, uh, and malleable way. So again, I teach, you know, I teach both the analysis side, the inquiry and the you know, so-called creative work. Um, and, uh, and for the most part, I offer what I call free projects as assignments. So students will choose the specifics, um, but there are, there are some parameters that are given. So people have room to pursue uh, their own interests. And the hope is that these sorts of projects are, like they say about, uh, about the guitar, uh, low stairs, uh, high ceiling. You know, you can do a lot if, you, uh, if you're very good at it, but you can still do something interesting if you're starting off at it. And that also means that people with different levels of background coming into this course, you know, will be able to, uh, and still do work that they can share with each other productively. So those are the high levels. To the, the basic example, at the very beginning, what I do is I start with a very simple but extensible uh, program modification. So program in JavaScript. And uh, I say, look, you can take all the words out of this text generator. You can put new words into your text generator here. And uh, you can open it up in the web and look at this. Uh, people who are, maybe aren't aware of the nature of a web page, even as uh, being a text file that simply could be manipulated. Uh, of a this is a page that has you know, JavaScript and CSS are included in it. So for now, we package everything together to make it very simple to deal with. And, uh, and they're able to quickly see that, oh, wait, I just made this really mean something different. I didn't change how it functioned, but even just changing out the data uh, created a different sort of experience. Um, so it does show the importance of data as well as process, and we can start to look at it. So and then another good thing to do, so we've, we've made all these changes. We've, we've edited these words. Another good thing to do is, well, let's just let's rip out a little bit of the code and see what happens. And we, of course, what happens is we get a black screen. The program doesn't work. We host it. Um, well, we'll just do Control-Z. We'll undo, and there it is back again, and there it's, you know, it's back. 
And so this is an, an initial way without introducing debuggers, without getting, you know, this is an initial way of saying, look, we can make some changes and if we proceed incrementally and if we check on what we're doing and see what's happening and test our understanding of it, then um, we can make some progress, you know, in a very simple way. And people can start to look at, this is a system that generates text um, step by step at a particular rate. So we can start to reason about, without knowing anything about JavaScript, we can say, well, how do we, uh, um, how do we think about uh, time? How is it, uh, at what rate is, is this text being produced? So we start, well, what do we, what do we wanna look for? Well, of course we could look for some word related to time, but we might ask, how is time gonna be represented? Oh, okay, it could be represented as a number probably. I mean, it could be fast, faster, fastest, but it's probably gonna be represented as uh, some type of number, some interval. So we can look for that. We can start making changes. We can see what happens. We can explore what happens when we change parameters. And it's pretty easy to understand a distinction between code and data, uh, things that can be manipulated, uh, transformed arbitrarily, some strings that are part of the program, and things that you're gonna crash the program if you mess with that right away. And then get a finer grain distinction and say, oh, well, there's also these things that are parameters and we can, we can modify those. So actually you can do a lot of reasoning about code this way. And, um, and this program that I, that I these, these programs that I present for people to modify are also available in Python so they can look and do the same thing in a different language. Um, uh, but of course you can't, uh, I, I don't, this is, this is a very initial step. And it's really, it's, it's also a step to reassure people that look, all that's involved here is editing a text file. We're not doing, we're not, it's not something like, you know, welding underwater, you know, where we, we have a physically demanding, difficult task. All we're doing is editing a text file. Um, if you break the program, it's okay. No one's harmed. You know, if you're learning to drive, you can kill yourself or other people. I mean, that, that you know, it happens sometimes, right? But if you're learning to program, it's not gonna happen. You know, it's okay, it, this is okay. So a lot of this is, uh, is to begin with this, these types of reassurances and to ground them in an activity. Yeah. So the audience for this are humanity students at MIT or where? So um, we, we have few humanity students at MIT, but yes, those that we have are part of the audience for this. And they yeah. actually need reassurance about this? Uh, yes. Okay. The, the graduate students who come, so it's a, you know, it's a different uh, admissions process, a different, they're, they're very, very uh, culturally different people who come in the humanities. Some people come with computer science bachelor's degrees. Uh, some people uh, are <coughs> math folks. I mean, some of them are, are what, you know, what Seymour Papert would describe as, as math phobic. They, they, really, they don't want to, they don't want to understand a coordinate system, you know. So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a wide variety. Um, and, uh, and the other thing, though, is that culturally, uh, programming is mystifying to a lot of people, uh, not just humanities graduate students at, at MIT and other places. Um, uh, there is an idea that uh, this is a, an industrial activity, that it's something undertaken by the people at Google and, and, and startups and companies and, and it's remote. And, uh, and so in a lot of ways, I'm just trying to recover what those of us who started programming in basic in the, in the 1980s, which I, I suspect there's a few here, um, you know, were already shown by that experience. Um, and then, uh, and then, so when I, what I do in moving on from this, I mean, this is, this is, this is really part of, part of the first day's lesson that I just described to you. And then we try to move on and discuss through uh, use of a, you know, a small constructed program and through use of other examples, some, some truly essential um, fundamentals by which, so for instance, I mean, not a big O notation, which is, which is very good for, I mean, I'm, computer scientists should certainly know about it. And uh, it's important for the science of computation specifically, but for people first learning to put together uh, computer programs in order to inquire and create, the things that I consider important are iteration, um, why it is that we bundle code together and things like functions, uh, how, uh, why type, not, not just that types exist, but also why they are there, that, that they are a cognitive aid to programmers and that, that error messages you know, that, are, that are produced um, are produced to assist in the, in the construction of a valid program. They are not uh, there to antagonize you, right? Um, and, you know, and the conditional. So with, at this first level, as people are trying to learn what I consider the, the, the true core fundamentals, we have exercises uh, to bootstrap uh, people's understanding. Um, these are not, not so much free projects, but I do have specific 
um, exercises where, you know, here's a variety of things to work through and figure out. But then we try to move as quickly as possible to free projects that allow people to uh, develop their own understandings and put these concepts to use. So that's the very basics. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, my own uh, use of exploratory programming myself. And the four examples um, that I'll give are um, uh, this project um, actually called 10 print char string 205.5 plus RAND 1 go to 10. Uh, which I collaborated on with nine others. I'll talk about that project and how we use uh, programming as part of our humanistic inquiry. Um, I'll talk about studying the creative process in uh, my system Curveship and the collaboration uh, Slant that I, uh, that I worked on. These are um, uh, language generation systems. Um, I'll discuss a little bit that one can write print poems, you know, sort of, I won't call them, they're not very traditional, but but, uh, but poems that are presented in a standard way, one can, one can write these with computational assistance. So that's one of the ways computing and exploratory programming can be used. And then developing computational pro, uh, poems uh, in my books, uh, Shebang, 2 by 6 and Autopia, for instance. So, so this, is the, this is the book, um, 10 print trust to 5.5 plus rand 1 go to 10. And uh, uh, so it's a project that I started um, where 10 of us, uh, wrote a single voice book. So it's just written like a normal uh, academic book. Um, and the topic is the title. It's this one line program for the Commodore 64. And uh, in part, this was presented as a sort of provocation because the people in critical code studies who were discussing this with me were very interested. They, they wanted to know all about comments and why people chose particular variable names and things like this. You know, and I thought, well, those things are important, but that's not, you know, if you get stuck at that level, you're not going to really be engaging with what the program is doing. So I offered this as an example where we don't know who the author is. It has no comments. And in fact, it has no variable names either. So, so uh, we have to talk about the code and what it does in order to discuss this. Yes. And I just have to say, <laughs> one day, MIT Press sends me this surprisingly long book to review <laughs> called 10 print char star <laughs> dot dot dot. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's incredibly interesting. <laughs> it was a really interesting book. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that was your reaction in some people's. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it is an exploratory book in a lot of ways. We don't have- We ended up not publishing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't have a uh, we don't have like a a, a a big high level theory that we're trying to you know uh, uh, roll out. We're trying to explore what is interesting about this. So this is um, you know if you if you uh, run the program it'll it'll do this. It's strictly the program is actually it'll do exactly this if you if you start a Commodore 64 and run this because uh, the you haven't reseeded the random number generator, but. Uh, um, but this is this is the basic uh, the basic output of the system, and um, uh, I find uh, I find it very interesting. It's it's and a lot of a lot of, of I mean everyone who everyone who participated in the project <coughs> found it interesting as well. Visually, it's doing something that looks like a maze. We had there were a lot of discussions. Is it really a maze? You know, and, and we have we have a, a, a maze or a labyrinth. With, this is all covered in the book. We have we have all these all these all these sorts of discussions. Um, but um, but one of the things that we did to investigate it is we said well. Why is this a Commodore 64 program? In fact, we actually started the book before we found a printed instance of the program. We just remembered it. And, and so we started, we started the project very early on, not because we, we had a, a cassette you know, with it on there, not because we had it printed. And, and later on, we found 20 occurrences of this program in print. But initially, it was just something we remember. And having this program in memory and being, I remember, going to school on the Commodore PET and typing it in and, and impressing people by uh, this display of one line uh, uh, computing prowess here. So, so this, is, this is, uh, is pretty remarkable, but why is it a Commodore 64 program specifically? And so to investigate this, I mean, it's, it's not, the same program runs on a Commodore PET or a VIC-20, but, um, but why, is it, why is it associated so strongly with, culturally with Commodore 64? Um, so one of the things we did is, is we looked at variations on it. So we, we made other versions of the program that did different things, and we looked to see whether um, you know these uh, uh, these you know in what way were these variations 
pleasing. In fact, one is encouraged to do this, uh, sometimes explicitly when this program occurs in print, play around with this, see what, see what can be done. But another thing we did is we ported it to different systems. So we said, all right, what's it look like on the uh, Apple II, on the Tandy color computer, uh, on the Atari VCS? Or in the terminal window, this is either in Perl or Python, they, they look the same. Um, and, uh, and so the, this, is, this was an interesting process in which we see, you know, you can see right away that the visual effect on the Apple II is very different besides the fact that the program is much more elaborate because you don't, the characters are not adjacent in ASCII or the closest thing to the characters that you would want to use. They're not adjacent in ASCII, so you have to do something a little weird. Um, the Coco also, it, it just doesn't line up. It doesn't look, it's, it's, it doesn't visually look like the type of maze that's so pleasing. Um, it's extremely difficult to get this. Uh, this is an assembly language, you know, a 6502 program for the Atari DCS. And, and to get the amount of randomness is very difficult. You don't have characters built in. You don't have any tiles of this sort. Um, and then actually, once we, <laughs> with Unicode, you have characters that diagonally go all the way across. And so now uh, you're able to sort of recover something that is somewhat like that, right, uh, in a modern day terminal. Um, but only because of uh, development of a character set. And by the way, Commodore 64 characters are not uh, included in Unicode, the actual graphical characters of Commodore 64. So, so this is part, part of the, the idea here is that in order to undertake an investigation, a scholarly intellectual humanistic investigation of this computer program, studying things historically, looking at the way people, reading books, look, reading magazines, understanding that in ways that going to the library, Carol, you know, uh, uh, that, that is a standard mode of humanistic research. We also wrote computer programs. Um, this is my system uh, curve ship uh, presented uh, um, architecturally here. And it's a system to do interactive fiction, uh, to program, uh, uh, to allow people to create interactive fiction that has narrative variation so that the same thing can be narrated in different ways. And, uh, um, so it has a bunch of units. The, the particular interesting ones from a research standpoint are this uh, Teller, a three-stage uh, pipeline for narrative generation um, that is based on different parameters and different world concepts. And what I'll just say is, you know, among other things, so after developing this system, we took out the interesting parts of it and combined it with um, uh, these other uh, systems, Griogen from uh, Fox Harrell, um, Mexica Libre, that is based on Rafael Perez y Perez, Mexica, but the re-implementation um, in Java by Ivan Guerrero. And, um, and so we developed, we developed a, a, a system here. It's, it's actually pretty large scale. It contains um, not, the, not, not um, exactly, well, it, it contains two fairly big programs. Griogen is sort of small, but it's based on a lot of earlier work. So it's really an integration of, uh, of a, a considerably uh, large project. And it's a blackboard system where these systems take a turn um, modifying a narrative specification, modifying a story specification. And they can influence each other as they do this. And then the uh, uh, curve ship um, uh, does the um, actual uh, generation the realization at the end stage there. Now, the reason I mentioned this at this point is that as we that, that even in this very very large scale project, this is sort of you know not exploratory in that we have a, 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 a some industrial sized uh, components here that are being integrated. Uh, we still use exploratory programming um, to determine what were, for instance, um, interesting narrators, like different particular specifications of the narrator that uh, that we could employ in this system. And in fact, some of that was done by Andrew Campana, who had no programming experience, but came over from Harvard and uh, um, uh, worked with us and started modifying Python templates and you know, was a contributor to the project eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Curveship was an IF system, interactive fiction. Yes. So yes, uh, there was a human author who authored the story That's and right. then it's uh, uh, portraying it dynamically in different ways. Yeah. I thought Mashika was a, a story generator. Yes. Is Slant a generator or is it? I'll tell you what each of these do. Okay. So Mashika is, so first of all, they can each, there's no restriction on who can make what changes to the narrative specification. But in practice, um, Mashika is the um, story expert describing what the plot um, is going to be. 
But in this system, Mashika elaborates the plot in a few stages. So for instance, if, uh, um, if um, uh, Verso decides this character is going to be the narrator, right? Then it puts a constraint and says to Mashika, don't kill this character. Uh, ghost? Right? What's that? No ghosts? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, American Beauty would be a counterexample. There are, there are, there are, yeah, uh, and, and, and Rashomon, right? But, uh, but so we can, we can put these, we can put these sorts of constraints on and, and we, can, we can work with this. So Mashika Libre is um, basically the full scale uh, Mashika uh, system. Um, uh, Verso is a system that determines what, uh, what the particular spin or what the narrative, uh, what the, what the, uh, uh, specification for for narrating what narrative discourse is going to take place so how so will things be told chronologically um if not what will be told out of chronological order um who will be the who will focalize the event who who, who will focalize the narrative who will um uh who will be the eye of the story will there be a you of the story um who is the narrative these these things are determined by verso um but in collaboration with the other systems and then uh with agriogen uh with, with fig s you have the, the figuration that's being determined. So what types of a metaphorical expression are going to be used, right? Um, and the system is made to where other components can be added on. So we go around and elaborate a story this way. And then this is, I don't have anything to compare. I don't have, it would be good for me to show you more than one of these so you can see a little about what can vary. But this is one, this is one example. So the, so the specific style of narrating, this is, this is a sports commentary style, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so it's a it's a uh, it's a type of narrating which is in the um, um, in the present tense, and in fact, um, uh, uh, and it, it interjects um, these uh, these types of expressions. One the, the the latest work that we've done in Slant actually was a, a project to um, to automatically generate uh, narrative expressions of surprise. So when narrators tell a story. Um, they sometimes express that they they sometimes express that they're surprised by things, or um, or they sometimes express that they're not surprised. Like this is ordinary. Like there's a, you know in Moby Dick, uh, there's no sense like you know this is um, this this you know this this is uh, um, it's, it's it's of course this isn't a big deal because it's always this way when people go out to see you know things like this, right? So so you might have these explicit types of of, uh, of suggestions, and in one of the the clearest cut case of where someone might genuinely be surprised is in is in uh, this type of sports narration um, because they're actually <laughs> saying things as they don't know what's going to happen they're saying it as it's occurring right so but this is this is so this is one example and so this is and we didn't we, we didn't really start you know we didn't have there was not like a topology of possible narrators that we populated like we we simply looked for you know things that were interesting so no, uh, no, that's right. This uh, this version doesn't do phenomenalization, so um, that's that's not uh, it's not that hard. I mean, particularly because we have an underlying model of, uh, of of who all the entities are, right? So um, I was just reading it. Those but that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Back to you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the one pronoun. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, and then oh, I guess I'll read this. Uh, this is an example of like a, a computer assisted uh, writing. So if you look for all, so, so let's say that, I mean, what I did in working on this is um, eventually I settled on looking for seven letter, seven letter words that have a lot of subwords, like a lot of their substrings are also words. Now, some of them have uninteresting substrings, some of them have more interesting substrings. You want a mix of, for instance, closed class and open class words probably. But, you know, that's what, this is what I did. And so, you know, I actually came up with several poems, seven, several poems like this, which, which I sort of discovered through search, you know, um, uh, uh, writing, writing just a short program uh, one day. And I think, you know, this one's not bad. Masking, as a king, I ask ma, I ask kin, as a king in a ski mask. So, you know, it tells an Oedipus story, basically, right? He's, uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, but it, it's just there. You just find it in the English language. And in, in fact, I mean, my, in my own poetic practice, like I'm, I'm most interested in finding things in the English language. I'm interested in what it is that the language has to offer and show. So if I were interested in personal expression, I might not use a technique like this, right? But, but this, in fact, is what interests me. And so this is one of the, 
ways to apply this. And we also use computational assistance in writing. Uh, uh, when I worked with uh, William Gillespie to write uh, 2002, a palindrome story, it's a, a 2002 word uh, palindrome that, that we released on New Year's of that year. And um, okay, so getting into the computer generated books, um, one of these uh, is um, Shebang, and I'm going to be reading from several of these at, I think, at 5 p.m. in English. Yes. Uh, You're English fine. Time. Okay. Right. Um, and, um, and so this is a book of, of programs and poems, and it's a collection of uh, code and the output that it, that it generates, rather than actually the other books are, are not, uh, um, not as various in their content. Um, and some of these are concrete poems, like, uh, uh, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is from, alpha, this is a little bit from alphabet expanding on the cover, but some of these are concrete poems that you run in the terminal and you can see a, 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 an animated effect that's different from <coughs> visually. Um, some of them are things that you can uh, pronounce and read. Um, one of these is um, uh, PPG 256 number so there's a series the PPG 256 series is um, uh, one that has seven uh, 256 character um, curl programs and I'll read you uh, I'll actually read it very briefly from this <clears throat> The tall, pole at cock, deep no con, the hair, mins no mong, hall on towels, pank of lant, pats on boon, the rant, bunt of cat, the hops, tank at bombs, ball on cost, backs to tots, tad on bash, cost on pan. So let me, let me mention some of my goals in putting this particular program together. I want to- Just reading the output of this program? Yes, or? yeah. So it, it produces um, uh, what I think is English-like uh, language that's actually shaped into poems, right? And uh, I mean, it's shaped, they, they have titles. Um, they have, a, a, they have a, a strophe that is some length of lines. Um, and, uh, and my goal in working on this, I thought, okay, well, why don't I set myself as a goal that I'll, I'll write a 256 character Perl program um, that generates poems. And first of all, I want uh, this to look like, I want people to recognize that it is a poetry generator, whether they like it or not. I want them to actually recognize it as such. And so visually actually um, shaping these, I mean, if you just produce a series of words that, oh, those are all English words, doesn't look like a poem. It, it looks like a, it, you know, I mean, I mean, it could be a poem if it's published uh, uh, and, and presented in, in a particular way, but it doesn't look like one. So shaping it was important. But the other thing is, I wanted it to have a large vocabulary, and this has a vocabulary of about uh, almost two thousand words, and uh, uh, that's, I think, that's that's pretty good. Now they're not all dictionary words, but more than uh, sixty-five percent are. So uh, and the, and and it's, it's pretty good. Um, and I just, I, the reason I mention it uh, is not, I, I, I don't have, uh, I, not particularly to elicit uh, um, admiration of the code or the output, but to tell you a little story about something I discovered in working on this particular program. So if I want to generate novel words, like I want to create new, new things that sound like English, um, how do I do it? What well-known algorithmic means would there be? Your that's 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 what I think is the right way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for some classes of words, I mean, you could do one of the things you could do, of course. Go, <coughs> is a, oh, I was just going to say you're going to need to alternate vowels and consonants, but apart true. from that, I well, one thing. Well, I mean, so we have we're, we're we're too sophisticated, I think, as language generators here. But of course, the thing that everyone always thinks of is uh, it has to do with conditional probabilities. I'll give you a hint, right? Is to use like a to use a markup process, right? And so that's a very classic thing. And this is what I mean. Most of my colleagues working in the broader world of language generation creatively are doing this. But it turns out, uh, if you wanted to do, let's say you want to do a letter-based um, markup chain to generate words, so you need 26. 
you have 26 letters and you need to define the probability of each of the 26 letters following each of the 26 letters. So that's 626 conditional probabilities. That's a pretty large number for a 256 character program, isn't it, right? So it turns out that the, the that fortunately for me, like because I, I don't I don't like this method of, of generating text very much uh, for for my own creative purposes. But fortunately for me, you can't you pretty much can't do that. Like the puzzle of how to, how to I don't know how you pack that in. You could you could do it in less than a byte for conditional probability somehow. But it, it would be it'd be very very difficult and, and ornate. So instead, I just took the beginning of uh, the top uh, 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 of all the words in English that are four letters long. I took the first two and last two, the initial and final bigrams, and, uh, and stuck them together. And it turned out a very, very high probability uh, these were dictionary words. And the ones that were dictionary words still sounded like English words. So I had a chance to talk to a phonologist, uh, you know, a faculty at MIT one time and, and discuss this with him. And he said, yeah, the, uh, you know, the onset and coda of uh, monosyllables is pretty much independent in English. And I thought, wow, he already knew that. <laughs> um, I was like, well, but then I, after a while, though, I thought, you know, he, how many years did he go to graduate school like in order to learn that? And I was just noodling around with Pearl for a few hours. Actually. <laughs> so, so it's something, you know, the fact that I recovered a sort of known result, I'm not sure it bothers me that much. I think that, and, and that actually doing something, you know, as part of a creative process that, uh, that is able to give insight into something that's known like this, that, that's interesting. Um, so these are some of the books I'll read from. Um, today, Two by Six is a collaboration with six other authors. It's a six language book. Um, and uh, Autopia is a book um, that uh, consists entirely of the singular and plural names of cars. Um, no other lexemes are in the are in the book. Um, so uh, so these are some of the works I and, and and you know I'll also read from the True List, which is another work that is actually based on compounding, which I've been very interested if not obsessed with, um, and it's a little bit more. Serious. Although I think even something, even, uh, Autopia has a particular type of cultural commentary to it. One of the things you find if you look at a, a text that's entirely car names is well, the names of native peoples are very frequently, <laughs> you know, used as the names of cars. Uh, and and the, the, the uh, uh, you know what sorts of what sorts of places appear, what sorts of, uh, of, uh, of animals are, are valid as car names. So uh, so these are some of the other works. And. Like verbs and articles. And yes, of, yes. Yeah. You can get well, no, no articles, but um, but yeah, ram, dart, uh, uh, rabbit. Um, so, rabbit is, is used as a verb in the movie Terminator. For those who remember, <laughs> he's got a rabbit. <laughs> but but, uh, um, but yeah, there are, there are there are these options. It seems hard to put sentences together. The, no, there are. There's a lack of close class words, definitely. But, but you can still do sort of headlining these sorts of things. Um, so, so that's, a, and, and the reason I mentioned two by six in Autopia also in part is they, they arose directly from these weren't uh, grand projects that I planned and uh, somehow, you know, fleshed out, went to Yada and, and fleshed out, you know, what was gonna happen. These really did arise uh, from exploratory types of thinking. So, um, so this is, I, I hope I covered at least a little bit of each of these, and I'm glad to talk about these topics or others. Um, uh, thank you. First question, is it at 5 p.m. today or 4 p.m. today? It turns out to be at 5 p.m. Okay. Well, then I'll take an afternoon view. Yes. <laughs> um, you're already down. Thank you. Uh, so, without going too deeply into the question of how much people have to understand, I hate the word formal, but you know, technical properties yeah. of the medium that they're manipulating. Yes, yeah, kind of a, of a connection between programming and the kinds of properties of the results that you're excited by. You know. The whole yeah. finding things inside of things or com combinations of things. I mean, that's what computer programs are. That's what they're made of, and that's what they manipulate, and that's what they do. So yeah, there's yeah. a sense in which I, I, I mean, I'm not trying. I, I think this is exciting. I mean, I think it's exciting to show people that there's 
that they themselves are generative machines, I suppose, yes. you know, or that the world is a generative machine. But, um, um, well, I guess I'll stop there, I guess. Does that make sense? You know, it's not a question exactly. But. Yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously there's certain, I, certain of my own inclinations in terms of, for instance, like, you know, what, what, why I'm interested in poetry, what, I, what types of poems I want to write, and so forth. Obviously, they're, they're better. If I, if I were interested in, um, uh, in poems that are assembled out of, you know, archival material uh, that, that documents certain aspects of history, then I would go to archives, right? And I would look for, I would look for material there, and I might not be writing small pro programs. Um, but I think that the, um, I think that the, you know, for, I, I offer I offer the, the ways in which this intersects my work as um, um, as an example. You know, that here's a particular practice, and here's the way that programming um, can inform this. Someone like um, like like for instance, I showed you know, the project by Lev Manovich and uh, Jeremy Douglas to you know a, a million pages of manga or you know Time magazine covers. Um, that are explored visually and that are arranged in different ways, right? That's, uh, I mean, I have, uh, I, I like these projects, but they're not the things I would do personally because I'm, I'm not as oriented toward visual studies, for instance. But they're very, very susceptible to um, work with programming and computation. I mean, what I'm trying to say is, what is it that people got out of that Commodore 64 program? What was their first, yeah. their first thing? I mean, their first thing is, wow, a really short program generates a surprisingly interesting thing. Yes, yeah. And that's probably their first thing. That's right, and um, you can modify it. It's a starting point right. for you to actually change code and learn more about uh, how uh, programming works. Um, it's open for you to do that. It's easy for you to do that. Um, and uh, and so the idea that you can do something as uh, someone, uh, and you know, people might even they might forget, they might come upon this accidentally because they might forget that two hundred five is a particular. Character code, they might put 202 in instead or something, right? right. In this case, you actually, okay, well, you would actually see a, a different outcome and you realize that oh, this, this can be changed and modified. It's, it's the same thing with typing and program, typing and basic programs for magazines. Like making typos as you do that is also like it, it could be an annoyance, but it could be a potentially productive educational experience, right? Because you, you understand that this is manipulable, that some of these minor changes matter. So part of me is resistant to the exploratory programming thing as a, as a pedagogical tool mm -hmm. because um, you know, I worry that once you get people into sort of bad habits of yes. you know, programming by random walk, that, that it's hard to get them out of those bad habits. Sure. But while you were talking, you know, it, it also occurred to me that there's a flip side to that. Uh, which is that when when students take programming, you know, sort of traditional programming classes, yeah. where there is a right answer, and you are given the spec, you know, and you will go in and implement it and so on, it's been incredibly hard to get them to like right. play, read, well, to play it, but also to like read documentation, right. uh, to like go and teach themselves because yes. they've been. You know, initiated into this world of programming as being about kind of pleasing the, the teacher. And, you know, when I stop and think about it, that isn't how I learned. Right. You know, I had some of those basic computer <laughs> programming books when I was in middle school, and, you know, yeah. no, there weren't any teachers around. Right. And so I really did learn the way that you're describing. Yeah. Um, and so I. I like the idea of sort of starting people out with um, with tinkering that way. Well, as hard as it is in computer science to get people to play and explore and learn, there is actually a good tradition of doing that. And I think that yeah. by the time people are, you know, get into their graduate work, um, you know, uh, they're they're they, they're not going to finish uh, uh, a PhD uh, without understanding that you can inquire and explore and learn to some degree through programming, right? So it's hard, even in the context where uh, that is valued, but it's something that's done you know, at an upper level. In the humanities, there's no right. context for this, right? right. There's, yeah. not, there's not a tradition of, oh yes, of course, you're gonna 
use a computer program to do something creatively or to inquire um, about uh, uh, these areas of, of intellectual concern, right? So, so I think that's that's particularly um, particularly the rationale for this area. And I'm, you know, so I mean, my my goal isn't to. I'm not trying to reform the way that people who are going to be computer scientists are taught about programming. I'm interested particularly in those who um, are going into uh, uh, areas of inquiry, you know, using programming in the humanities and the arts, where uh, there's uh, there's uh, very little uh, framework um, for for doing that. And in fact, I mean, you also face um, uh, you face resistance, of course, in a lot of cases to, to work in these ways. It depends on the department that you're in and the context you're working in, but. So, so, I mean, how to design programs, this, this is one of the central goals of the book is to try to tease apart where it's a, mm -hmm. to tease apart where is the structure the most beneficial and where is the creativity the most beneficial and give students yeah. a way to get their heads around the two different yeah. sides of this program. So, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I and, and I should also say, I mean, one of the things like, although uh, there are exercises in exploratory programming that is part of the course, but for the most part, we do try to avoid that and try to try to avoid the sort of solution oriented mode. But one of the ways in which I teach is, you know, to say that you always uh, that, that it's important for beginning programmers to always have an idea of what is going to happen when you're when you're working in IPython notebook, Jupyter notebook, when you have a code snippet, when you press shift enter and you see what's going. To, you you need to if you don't if you don't have a model of what's going to happen, then you can't be wrong or right. So there are there are these aspects. It's it's not it's not pure play. It's uh, it, it's a balance of understanding where to uh, how to best scaffold and understanding a program. So I was just going to say in this area in terms of whether that in the areas we like to get to in the humanities, you know, the other areas that sort of got taken over by computation kind of did it because people within the field. Did it, right? I mean, it, it wasn't like computer scientists went out and said, "Oh, you guys need to do computational right. biology." Now we provided tools, but they were sitting there chugging away, and that's right. So, oh, that's oh, you could, you could we can run a much better program than that, right? But it was driven by the, and so I think after this many years, and people like yourselves and others who in the humanities have taken to the computational paradigm, it seems yeah. there must be other reasons than the lack of, of of the tools and stuff that's that's keeping it from spreading. That it's that you know it's. That because people have experimented, people have built it, and nobody else picks it up. I mean, it seems that it always seems to. No, I, I I agree. I mean, I think that I think that uh, I don't think it's, it's I don't think there's a simple answer. The but what I would say is um, that uh, you know for me the, the the closest thing I could see to a tipping point is where the work that is done, the intellectual work done using computation, becomes so significant that it can't be ignored. And the, then my question is, well, how do we accomplish that in the humanities? Um, we've had text encoding initiatives. We have digital humanities, which is very, you know, better types of work and so forth. And um, and so one of the things I had, I, was, I, I said, well, I could go, I could spend all my time building a really good computational models of narrative theory, which I've spent some of my time doing, right? Um, but ultimately, if we're going to reach that tipping point, I think that people do need to do it from within the discipline. They need to learn how to program and they need to be licensed to uh, work intellectually on the topics that they care about like through computing and program. So in other words, I, I don't, I'm not gonna provide the, I'm not gonna, uh, I don't have the, 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 the critical uh, piece of research that can't be ignored within the humanities. I'm not gonna come up with that. But if uh, 500 people learn to program as a result of this book, my teaching and other people's teaching, and they develop projects, um, we could get there. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm a teacher in the theater department. Um, and so I wonder if um, kind of coming from that side within the field of being interested, but also looking at finite resources of uh, kind of mental space and financial and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The time that it would take to upskill myself in programming, um, as opposed to you know finishing dissertation, um, I wonder if there can be a middle ground of interdisciplinary spaces where people work on teams with um, you know humanists who maybe if they're in that math phobic space or um, you know just don't know how to program, 
working with people who do know how to program. Yes. Um, and that might be kind of a, a, a middle step. I think there are such uh, possibilities. I mean, and I certainly support collaboration, which I which I've done. You know, and, and, and not just in the case of Timprint, but otherwise. Um, at the same, so, but at the same time, I think like, let's say like, if I, if I discover, you know, as a, as, a, as a master's student, for instance, that like, I'm really interested in Augusto Boal and I'm really interested in like, I particularly like, there's like theater in Brazil is like really, really my thing. And I wanna, you know, I, I this is what my, my work is gonna be on. I wanna, I wanna do a dissertation, I wanna develop. I would learn Portuguese, right? I mean, and, and I would go there. <laughs> but, would you be, but would you become fluent enough in Portuguese that you could then write in Portuguese? In yeah, that's right. So I mean, you you can have goals. I think um, whether you, whether it's yeah, I, I think that you well for <laughs> now we're talking about language, like language learning rather than programming. Right. But but in any case, what you do is you you set a goal. Mm -hmm. for, for what you're interested in. Like, I would like to be able to walk around unescorted, you know, in uh, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, you know, and talk to people and like have ordinary conversation. Like that, that, would, that might be a goal that you would have as a language. I mean, I'm just saying like this would be, you, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm uh, describing this in such detail is that you wouldn't say like, I will just always get, you know, I'll, I'll always get the guy to accompany me right. and I'll always, you know, right. I'll, I'll do everything through collaboration with someone who knows the language, right? You would you would say that you, you actually want to learn the language, and you might have different you might have different goals. Some you might want to present in uh, in give a paper in Portuguese, or you might want to or or, or write you know or, or or whatever else. Or it might be it might be another goal. But my point is just that somewhere along the line, I also don't want to make what I've already done make an analogy between learning to program and learning to <laughs> and natural language, but but um, uh, but there are there are things that are similar, like or like participating in a sport, learning a musical instrument. I mean, they're all things that you need to do through practice. That that you can't you you're not just going to figure out looking at a book like how to do it. I mean, being an anthropologist would be the same. You have to you have to do it through practice. So so I would just say like, don't put it don't don't um, uh, collaboration is great. I encourage it, but don't don't make it an excuse not to not to gain what are really important. Um, um, uh, uh, skills um, for your own for your own work. So there are some people who, if you think that like comprehension is really going to be the key to what I'm what I'm trying to do in my work, then you should be like that person who wants to learn Portuguese. Yes. But, but there's certainly there's a spectrum there. Uh, yeah. I mean, we uh, 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 recently we've been we've been uh, talking to a lot of other uh, other departments and. Uh, I'll give you a quick example is, is uh, people from psychology who came to us and said, oh, we want our students to take their machine learning classes. Uh, and there's a moment of like, yes, but it, machine learning has five prerequisites. Yeah. If your undergraduates come and take our machine learning classes and go through the five prerequisites, we will own them at the end. They will be computer scientists with a vague, uh, a vague interest in, in psychology. Yeah. Uh, and you don't want that. Um, but what you might want is for them to understand what the length and breadth of, uh, of different techniques of machine learning can do for them, right. and then work with people who might actually have sort of uh, yeah. greater depth in terms of the sort of the, the details of the algorithms. And it seems like we can't have it be every, I mean, the word computational is going to be in front of every field at yes. some point, and it can't be everyone has to become a program. Well, see, I'm not even talking about learning, uh, I'm not talking about teaching computer science. To other fields, I'm talking about programming, right? So, in other words, I'm not. It's not uh, actually the science of computation. It's how to use computer programming. I mean, we all there's plenty of people. You know, probably know people in the industry who have no background in computer science or very good programmers. Carry out their their work very well. Right, right. programmers. Anyway. And they're they're programmers. I wouldn't say very good. Well, okay, <laughs> but, but I mean, well, it, within I mean, fitness to a niche, perhaps, right? I mean, okay, so so. I, I think that what and, and there's different fitness to be able to think and inquire and create, you know, with programming. But um, I don't think that what you need to do that is the same is five prerequisites to take a, a, a machine learning course. So, so I do. I think that I think the um, um, uh, I, 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 I I'm not I'm not sure how. Um, 
I mean, one of the things is one of, one of the things when you look across disciplines and you look at what other people are doing in social sciences and humanities and arts. So first of all, I mean, there's not this prerequisite structure. You, you know, computer science students can come and take, you know, I mean, at MIT, they can take a, a, a advanced uh, playwriting or, you know, uh, advanced uh, uh, fiction, as long as the instructor agrees. You don't, you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to have background well, for this. We used well, to be that way until there were 10 bazillion students. So yeah, right, right, right. So, well, so this is, this is, okay, now we're getting to the, now we're getting to the, core, ago, the yeah. core of the problem, right, which is that we, you know, in the humanities, we're uh, like, there are a few people interested in programming and doing work with computation to address the subjects intellectually, and they're finding very little, uh, uh, very little context for this, very little environment that supports that work, right? Um, and uh, and and so you have a you have a case where it, you can offer a course for for humanists and artists that you know, and, and try to attract people and try to get people in the department to think it's a good idea and so forth. While at the same time, within computer science, um, you need to you know you need to turn people away because there aren't the resources to teach um, everyone who's coming. So there are very there are different institutional contexts and situations for this. But I think teaching, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things that's been done at MIT is a uh, course six minor. So minor in computer science has just been introduced. Whether that will cause, whether that will alleviate the strain on the major remains to be seen, but that's part of it. Um, so people, people take different institutional steps, I think. The, uh, the thing I would say though, is that you need to, um, this is one of the reasons I think that teaching, uh, that not, not, funneling everyone through the introductory computer science course, everyone in the, in the, in the uh, university, right, is, 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 is good thinking. I, no, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I, 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 I absolutely agree with this. The question is whether or not it's, I would, I would, I would argue that perhaps the, what you want them to understand is not programming, but maybe something else. But I mean, it's in the same, I mean, I love the emphasis on programming. I think that's of course. <laughs> good Lord, man. <laughs> Look into your own soul, for God's sake. <laughs> the, I, I mean, that it's uh, um, that that the um, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in, in sort of partnership and, and cross functional yeah. and all those things. Uh, and, and 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 it's trying to find a characterization that's maybe different than what we did as, as when we were in our our. our um, um, but in yeah. some ways, maybe the same. Actually, it might be. That's it why might very well be. It might very well be. Um, right. It might very well be. Yeah. But but I would also say, you know, having done collaborations with people in the arts and humanities, it really helps if the people in the arts and humanities have taken at least a little bit of programming, so that they have some sense of what the space of things you can write a computer program for are. Because I've, I've literally oh, no, had no, no. artists say things like, well, will you make me a simulation of right. Buddha? No, no, I, I mean, the, that's a great explanation about this. The, the, <laughs> getting rid of the magic and, and getting, the, getting to the fact that it's all nuts and bolts at some, at some level, I think it's crucial. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Okay, well, I think we it's should so probably pack you up <laughs> <now laughs> right. and use space on the video. But All right. let's thank Nick once again. I'll show you a question. I like to do. You probably know Laura. Do you know Laura? I know Laura. Yes, I actually, she's been on a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I talked to her. I would say hi. Sorry. I have no idea. We haven't actually been here, sorry. Larry, hey, Hi. thanks for coming. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. 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 right. uh, um, yeah. the yeah. yeah. right. I'm actually filming right. a video game adaptation with some folks at Paul, where I'm in this. Oh. Kind of like I, I could program mm. in scratch, but that's about it. But they're doing the Unity something. That's, uh, that's, uh, yeah. So, why why so, are you working so, with people at the Paul? Um, because there weren't uh, game designers here, or just be uh, uh, and well, for us, we should all have the one at lunch met, and then her husband and her kids and I, otherwise, she, they're kind of tag teaming us. Is I have an identifier or a card? Or I do have a card. I also, if you Google, what is it? Shake
a video game dot com. There's a whole bunch of you're in the psychology department. And Ian worked with me. I was a civil design fellow, and Ian was my advisor. Are building a Joker video game for me that I prototyped in really terrible prototype that Ian suffered through in scratch, but they're building it in. Where, where is this? She's at um, DePaul. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she's in front of that. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Thank so you so what's, much. What's the t I, I need to hear more about that. Shakespeare video game too, but we'll, I think are we going to talk? Uh, uh, I'm not on your list. Okay, but, but we can put you on the list. Yeah. Um, I don't want to tomorrow morning. Just tell me. Yes, I. I mean. Yeah. I, I already get, I gate crashed here. Yeah, I will okay. gate crash. No, that was but tell me, tell me your first because I, I just did a I just did a code generated book. Okay. That's uh, all my smooth body, uh, which is a uh, Shakespeare. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a uh, it was it's a, like one like. Project of a few hours for uh, for nanogen. Well, it's not a it's not a book book it's not yeah. published that way. But uh, but I but I'm interested to. Uh, I would love to get on your schedule so if you've what, got any space. What's the, what's the key? What's the, what's the game? Uh, it's called Something Wicked, uh, and okay. it enacts the first battle in Night Pass. Okay. It's very bloody. It's based on the Bias yeah. Tapestry, the Book of Ages. Sort of. Uh, yeah. The Roman Polanski style. <laughs> have you seen, have you seen the? <laughs> Roman Queen, excuse me, Beth. Yes, but they're in that. Yeah, so we we yeah. we solve the gore problem by making it fabric, so we can do whatever we want because it is fabric. Yeah. Okay. This another thing you can do is you can have a you can have a sword that automatically cauterizes the wound, mm -hmm. and then think about like how like, uh, we think can about how a light the light <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Think about how gory those movies would be. I want to. <laughs> I want to check the trademark on that one. <laughs> Are you? No, no, no. You know what? It, it ended up. It ended up being. Um, I hooked up with Doris at DePaul, who runs the Play for Change Lab there. Yeah. Do you know her? Uh, another Play for Change Lab. Yeah, she started that there a few years ago, and then she has a background in theater. Cool. And so she sparked the idea immediately, and for oh, a while I have met she Doris. was. Yeah, I actually have met her. Yeah. Yeah. So for a while she was trying to help me find a student designer who could do it. Yeah. And then in the, she, you know how it is. <laughs> she kept asking, well, what if we did this? Well, I can see if we did this. Oh, hell, I'll just do yeah. it. <laughs> and so she and um, her husband, Misha, uh, who lectures yeah. at the fall, he had more time to project manage. Cool. And they just kind of like the folks who built her last game, she was like, you want to do this next project? And they were all like, yeah. yeah. Because you don't let us do bloody stuff, Doris. <laughs> this sounds great. We can do all these socially meaningful games. We yeah, cut off a bunch of heads. I could see why DePaul would end up being the part of town that has like a lot of people. Their game design program. Yeah. So and all the graduates, all the I think the the two programmers are undergraduates, so they've gone through that extremely rigorous sure. DePaul design program, yeah. and then the animator kind of industry placement focus kind of program. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and then the animator also, and his stuff is just knocking out. So yeah, so we're hoping to be in. Beta by April. Okay. That's the look like. We'll see. But yeah, it's kind of hummed along all of a sudden. Very we did a crowdfunding cool. campaign over the summer, and that worked out. Do you, so you know the website ChicagoMakesGames.com? Is, is that the website for the independent independent game developer? It is an aggregation of all video game related events in Chicago. I feel like I've so been on that. So you have a fundraiser, play test events. Okay. You know, uh, if you're just showing it at a fest, you should put it on there. I absolutely will. Yeah. Right now, it's just, you know, it's just 
little blocks moving across the screen. Right, right. With a fabric background. Yeah, but that, that's a pretty comprehensive. Also, at the bottom of that website, it's every, like, a pretty comprehensive list of every game work uh, that you can get in touch with in your cool. studies. Yeah, um, no, that'd be good because our next, my next thing that I need to figure out is how to host. Because it's, be it's only a five minute game. Uh -huh. And I have no desire to get into the business of selling things. So I don't want to go through Steam. Well, if you don't need sales revenue, then don't. No, I don't you want know, to. Right? So I'm trying to figure out how to just make it available for people to download from using. Um, because it's not going to be like a Corona web app. It's developing for web was more expensive. Sure, sure. So just we had to go as bare bones. I possible. just put it on itch. Um, okay. There are these other kinds of indie game hosting sites. So that's like the cool one. Yeah, so itch. Itch, yeah, itch.io. Okay. okay. Yeah. And you could it. even put it, if you need funding, you can put on a pay what you want kind of thing or just say it's entirely free. No, it's, I want it to yeah. be, yeah. We did the funding already to pay for the All right, right. So we're, I'm fully funded. We'll build the thing. Cool. I would do a pay what you want, but then I would have to deal with revenue and I don't want it. This is a, this is a critical making project. Yeah. This is not a revenue generation. Sure. This is a, a scholarly. You should also consider when Flint is more than blocks on the screen, yeah. um, submitting it to BitBash for next year's festival. Okay. Yeah. So, which would be another organization that would be all the info would be at the, on the bottom of that thing. Okay. Yeah, I think I've seen. I think I've seen that come through on. Uh, I'm on the box. BitBash is great. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. so that this is, it's all one yeah. kind of big blob of people who work together, but are chopped up under different words. Yeah. But they're really all the same big awesome community. Yeah. So, but so yeah, box stuff like Jamie Center is me. Bit bash organizer. Awesome. Yeah. Different. Yeah, I just kind of lurk on Voxel. Sure. <laughs> and but they they were the ones who connected me to Doris because I said Ooh. what I was looking for and they were like, listen, you should get in touch with her. That's excellent. Yeah, so like the students I'm teaching are film students mm -hmm. that I'm introducing to Unity and Twine and that yeah. sort of thing, right? So it's like not the kind of student that's ready right. to I mentioned like I sort of want a Diablo phone. I was like, oh. That was what not these well, students. we moved away from that really fast. Yeah. Because, but we wouldn't have been able to move away from that unless I was working with experienced game designers because yeah. they they saw what I wanted to do. And they, like, they don't speak in Shakespearean play directing. <laughs> they speak in game design. Uh -huh. And so there's been this really amazing collaboration of them saying, well, we could code it like this and make it so that this happens. Is that an accurate reflection of how things work out in play? It's great like, that they no, have the, it's not really. It's great that they have to be able to ask the questions though, yeah. right? Where there's often just this one-way street of like client to designer, where it's like, I have the idea, it was there. And then there's resentment because you give it to the product and say, this is what you said you wanted. Right. And you say, it actually needs to be different. And I'm like, oh, that's good again. Yeah. And this is like a, like a huge cultural yeah. problem of expectations between humans. And there's yeah. just a lot of stuff that's yeah, crazy it's, important. It's so important. And I, I mean, I, I, I asked the question, but I think it's because this seems to me about four steps down the road from where I am. And I don't know many humanists who know how to program as well as I do. Right. Which I say, like. There are a lot they, of them, though. It's perhaps a. Yeah. I mean, I'm one, so I hang out with them. You yeah. Know, but I mean, like, like me saying I know how to program, yeah. it, like, that's such that's, a low bar, but I understand what code is. Right. So. And I could, like, make you a recursive circle in Logo. But I like I know now I know what it means. Those those low steps are so important for having yeah. meaningful conversations yeah. so that you can have these sort of things happen. And like you often find this kind of trap that was presented here is like, well maybe if you let some people program but don't really program, they're gonna establish bad habits. Or maybe the other thing is the other side of the spectrum is um, you know, okay, humanists can start programming, they have to take all of the classes. Too much. Like there's so many it's grades in between those yeah. two poles and yeah. they're meaningful. Yeah. Right? I learned they make a huge how, difference. Yeah, I learned how to like make a turtle walk and make a square and I made a really terrible maze game, but it worked. Yeah. And I taught myself I mean like the game they used to teach eighth graders to program, right? I taught myself scratch and yeah, then I made yeah, another yeah. really terrible prototype and realized I said wasn't terrible, it was exactly what it needs to be. Right. You know? I realized, and then I like downloaded Unity and went, um, okay, there's no, I can either spend the next four years learning this, <laughs> or I can go find people who already know how to do it well, and then we can work together. Yeah. If you want to, it depends, it depends on what kind of features the game needs. Yeah. Right? You can make meaningful stories in Unity 3D. 
uh, that just sort of have simple reactive moments, yeah. no collection mechanics, no right. save states, no right. start screens and end screens, but they're still, a, I'd say, a film student who right. has a hard time understanding what Finder is, right? So right. you can make that game in two seconds. Right. You know, but of course, it's just with where you want to move the slider and what your expectations for features are. Right. You know? And mine were fairly high. Yeah. <laughs> because that was what I needed yeah, in yeah. order to have it be an actual. It's like the different, I'm a theater director. This was like the difference between a bunch of students learning about the play by putting it up themselves right. versus collaborating on a professional production. You learn a lot from both, yeah, yeah. but they're different. Yeah. And this was what I was going for. And so I realized that I needed to, I could now, I can understand when they're making a joke around the table about some feature that of course you would never do versus when they're actually having a conversation yeah. about like, what if we have this event? But I, I, don't, I don't know what the full range of possibilities is because I don't know the whole thing. Right. Um, but but they do. It's interesting having no idea and having some grounding so you're not asking something like that. Like, how do I, yeah. I don't know, make it be magical? Yeah. You're like, well, how do we get a little more specific language with that? Yes. Yeah. So I don't look like an idiot around the table. <laughs> like I, I speak, I could get around Portugal by myself. <laughs> Yeah, at this point. one of our specialties. Well, I guess I'm going to wait for Ian to come back. Okay. Maybe I'll lurk in the hallway. Sure. In case he I gets. Find the direction. Wait for him. Is to this go. a whole day thing? Um, I think this is what tech gets just if they have one meeting. I think that's what happens. I think you get croissants. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, every every meeting I come up to, like for the. I mean, the, look at how many snacks are actually consumed. Do, they're so, like, in a, in a, on the south side of campus, I all bet gone. It, I bet Everybody it, would be pocketing the apple juice. Yeah. But it's not only um, this place is full, but I bet they only have to, like, push one button. Yes. In <laughs> advance of planning. Yeah. Okay. And then it, it automatically arrives. It's coffee is something. Well, it was so good to meet you for a good chat. going to eat some of your fruit. Good. In every meeting I come up to on this end of campus, the food is just so wonderful. There's not food at the candy store. <laughs> that surprises me. So I think of the, like the art meetings as like having, I, I, yeah. I will say at the ordinary media um, workshop, which you would be great if you could come to one of those. I know they might. Like, this is Danny Snelson, who's a digital humanities postdoc, and Jim Hodges, who's in the English department, has right. a strong interest in the digital stuff. Uh -huh. all, it's all humanities people. Uh -huh. And they are meeting just like 
third Wednesdays. I'll look at their schedule okay. for the spring. Um, but they bring whiskey. Ah. Uh, it's a Kaplan. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, can you do 10 a.m.? Mm-hmm. And then I will go from there to DePaul because we have our mechanics off meeting tomorrow, too. Okay. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to have you actually do the meeting here at Ford. At Ford? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Right, right. Yeah. In, in my building. Yeah. Because all the other meetings are going to be there. Sure. Um, and then we will find an office that you can. Can I meet you at your office? I will let you know. I need to talk to Charlene about how we want to handle the schedule for that. But like Chaz is going to use my office when he meets with um, Nick at 1.30. Thank you so much for sure. putting me on the schedule. Oh, thanks. Thanks for doing it. Um, how, just let me know also what time and where I should drop them off and I can handle transit uh, if that would be helpful. Right. Actually, I'll share the calendar with you. And I'll give you my cell phone. Remind me of your email address. G-B-H. That's the Elizabeth Beth. Mm -hmm. At Northwestern? Yeah. No, sorry, UDAP. Ah. I'm a student. And just EBH, no, not like EBH977 right. or anything. No, like EBH that. at UDAP Northwestern. All right. Okay, so you have his schedule now. And so, you know, we'll, we'll figure out where you're meeting with him. But then afterward, you're going to. Take him to meet with Hao Chi Zhang. Okay, yeah, I know Hao Chi. Okay. Yep, he does the lab meeting. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll. Um, he also usually has open spaces where we might be both together. It was really hard for me not to see it. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Trade of Columbus is still happy because I needed to lay it. Oh. A metal virtue. You know, I can hold on to it, bring it to him later. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have a, a copy at home that I can. Oh, no. Two, three, twenty times. Yeah, through the library. <clears throat> Better you could also meet with him here. No, unfortunately, I cannot do that. Um, I can. <clears throat> well, let's just stick with 10 a.m. Okay. Um, and I'll. If I, if, if you get covered up and, and you don't have a chance to let me know or something, I'll just come to your office if I don't. Sure, you know, And then sure. you can redirect me to another yeah. location. Yeah. Excellent. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Oh, I'm going to take a tree.
Colin being nosy, I'm glad Jim had this on your dinner tonight. Ask Jim about the um, ordinary media. Okay. He's, a, he's coming to stained glass with you. Thank you for doing that. Oh, of course. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. How about you? I'm okay. okay. Is this a, a busy time or a slap time for you? Uh, I mean, like right at the moment? Or? Yeah. I, I, I just mean like... Uh, it's oh, like the time of year. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it's, it's still busy. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, you know, we have that, that week off of uh, right around Christmas. We used to not even get that. So if I didn't get vacation, book vacation early enough, I'd have to be here. <laughs> Thanks again. About to go Thank to uh, uh, Manisha's. Uh, she has like a holiday party. She invites select staff too. So oh, it's funny. Nice. I got invited like like three years ago. I didn't even get invited last year, but now I get invited this one. So, yeah. I don't know. It's just yeah. <laughs> kind of funny.